think about what we've done and feel proud. Our thanks go out tonight to the 7th Corps Public Affairs Office and members of the 133rd Public Affairs Detachment, Kentucky National Guard, for their contributions to this program. Take care and have a safe Memorial Day. Nine months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, U.S. Army Europe became engaged in a mission dramatically different from their previous 45 years in Europe. USERA was thought of only as a deterrent to Soviet and Warsaw Pact aggression. Events after the wall have proven USERA's value as a forward deployed contingency force. USERA deployed over 70,000 soldiers to Southwest Asia and fought gallantly in Operation Desert Storm. As forces returned home to Germany, thousands of other USERA soldiers deployed to Operation Provide Comfort and Kuwait. This documentary is a record of the magnificent achievements of America's soldiers, civilians, and family members living in U.S. Army Europe. In November 1989, the world watched the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. The German reunification process was beginning, and change was coming to the United States Army Europe. It was both the end and the beginning of an era for usury. To defend themselves, and you thus help to bring about the end of the Cold War. For over 45 years, the keepers of the peace had walked their posts and kept their silent vigil. Always answering the call to duty, they had successfully deterred aggression and brought peace and stability to Europe. Iraq has invaded the country of Kuwait in what President Bush has... Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, has shocked the Arab world. Iraq has killed thousands of innocent civilians in the country of Kuwait, and Saddam Hussein has... Nine months after the fall of the wall, the shock wave of brutal aggression in Southwest Asia ended the worldwide celebration of freedom. Again, the nation's call to arms was sounded, and America's sons and daughters serving in USERA met the challenge. Ed called me up and said, do you think you can deploy a corps? And I said, sure, I think these guys know how to do that kind of thing, and they're ready to fight because they've already been training. First off, it really expresses a lot of confidence in the soldiers in USERA and what they've been doing. It has a lot of confidence in the capability of the organization and has a lot of confidence in our NATO allies because we couldn't have done it without them. So it was, uh, it was a good feeling of uh, they think that we got our act together and we're going to show them how to do it. It's not every day you're in an organization that has to send soldiers off to war, even though that's our business. So my first gut feeling was like, wow, uh, 7th Corps out of Germany going someplace else. My second reaction was piece of cake. Um, their training uh, was very good. Their equipment was very good, the best the Army has. The leadership was outstanding. Uh, I knew that we knew how to deploy uh, because as a matter of routine, our soldiers, every time they go to the CMTC or they go to Grafenbeer, are required to railhead, uh, load their equipment on flatbeds and uh, do those kinds of things. So uh, my second reaction was, Ooh, we'll be able to do this and we'll do well. The training that was done in the past uh, paid off because when we arrived in Saudi Arabia, we knew exactly what the threat was. We knew how to contend with the threat. And the training that we did in USRA uh, paid off tremendously. Training over here, we, we do a lot of intense training. And when we train, we train for real, even though we are in Europe and it's a totally different environment. Uh, Grafenbeer was a big help because you had to know how to do everything in graph, and if you got out in the desert and didn't know how to do it, it was too late then, there's no time to learn. Ready to answer the nation's call to arms, 
User is highly trained, forward deployed mobile force engaged in the most challenging movement of forces since the 1944 Normandy invasion. I characterize the immensity, it was absolutely mind-boggling. We moved over 70,000 soldiers, more than 40,000 pieces of equipment. We haven't done anything like that since World War II over here. Um, to give you a little comparison, normally on a reforger operation, as you know, we do that every year. If we unload two to three ships, we pat ourselves on the back. Uh, during Desert Shield, we loaded over 115 ships. We used almost 340 trains. I mean, an engine pulling about 30 cars. Uh, we used almost 380 barges, and you've seen those kinds of things flying the Rhine. In addition to that, we've, uh, we ran 70 or 80 convoys, and we moved a few things by air. The bottom line to this all is if you wrap that up, it almost equates to just about 600 trains. And uh, the magnitude of 600 trains, until you've seen one train and how long it is, and you take it times 600, you know it's a pretty big operation. And the good news is, is that folks did it very professionally. I think it was unprecedented in the history of the battalion, the amount of tons, the amount of commitments that we were involved in day in and day out. All of this was done after we had deployed one and a half companies to Saudi. So the units back here knew they had to suck it up. Uh, we were also involved with moving all the special munitions uh, to the aerial port at Ramstein. We were involved in the retrograde of INF uh, Pershing II missile systems. We had four different convoys going on at the same time. And so uh, our op tempo, the amount of standby drivers that we had day in and day out, uh, I think has been the largest in our history. I was really impressed uh, by, by the amount uh, of work, the, the, again, the dedication that was uh, shown by all of the, the soldiers and the civilians. Uh, it just everybody had the attitude that uh, not one soldier in Saudi Arabia was going to uh, go without a bullet uh, and then have it, you know, be uh, our responsibility for not having shipped it. Uh, uh, they, they were there to see that the job was done. Usura soldiers were trained and ready for what lay ahead. Soon the dust of Grafenvir training area would be replaced by the sands of Southwest Asia. Soon the silence of a great peace in Europe would be replaced by the thunder of battle. In an address from the White House, President Bush announced that the liberation of Kuwait has begun uh, against Iraq in the first step to crush their military power and drive it through. Our soldiers were very well prepared when they came here. They had developed great training skills in Germany, Grafenbeer, Hohenfeld, CMTC, gunnery. So we felt confident that what we had to do was adapt those proven skills to the desert environment, and our soldiers being very adaptable did that very quickly. The first element in caring for soldiers is to ensure that they're prepared for their wartime mission. And we felt good about uh, the, the combat readiness, preparedness of our soldiers coming out of Germany. In a situation like that, it's training that, uh, that really sets the, sets the standard. And uh, 32nd ACOM Air Defense Training Strategy was an uh, integral part of our preparation to go through something like this. Uh, it's a sequential progressive way in which we could train our soldiers to, uh, to perform the way my soldiers perform the night of that Scud attack in Haifa. Defensive missiles and American missile crews from Germany to Israel to protect. Said Israel will wait and see if the Patriots will. An Israeli it. official in Washington says Israel will, for the time being, not retaliate against. Less than three days after the start of Operation Desert Storm, Patriot batteries from U.S. Army Europe were on the ground in Israel. Twenty-seven hours after notification, Task Force Patriot Defender deployed from Germany to the Middle East and checkmated Saddam Hussein's attempt to split the coalition. And once we got in Haifa, as soon as my vehicle pulled in, the alarms went off. And um, we had done this so many times during practice, but knowing that it was for real, it was different. So um, from all the practice that we had had, all the training, 
we just knew what to do. We put our mask on and continued with the mission. The thrill of it was a chance of a lifetime. And actually go in and in place under darkness, and the scuds start coming in and firing under fire. It was like, you know, you think, ooh, this is war, you'd get scared and run, but your mind takes over on your job. You're taking care of your equipment, trying to in place, taking care of your soldiers, so you really ain't got time to be scared. I mean, you have the fear of respect, but you just drive on with your mission, what you train to do constantly, and you carry on with that. My being able to wear my 32nd AtCom patch on my right shoulder and uh, know that I was part of USER was just one of the proudest moments of my life was when we were able to go down there and, uh, and really prove the quality of soldiers that are within USER, especially the air defense soldiers. The deployment of fighting forces to Saudi Arabia and air defense weapons to Israel was not the end of USER's support to Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Before and throughout the war, USER soldiers, alongside their NATO allies, loaded and shipped fighting vehicles, hardware, and ammunition to the multinational forces in Southwest Asia. We had to have the cooperation of the countries. Uh, the cooperation was unbelievable. There were four territorial commanders that we dealt with. Uh, Belgium, Holland, Territorial North Germany, and South Germany. And I uh, called them up on a Friday evening after work each one of them at home. They said, whatever we need, that's what we'll do. I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, we had all the contracts signed for the ports, we had to give in the mission to the rail lines to move. I mean, it was not a bureaucratic thing. They really knew how to make stuff happen. After the Seventh Corps left, there were a lot of folks that stayed back here that began to push other supplies and equipment, ammunition and those sorts of things to the port. And we did that. Uh, on an order of magnitude that no one had ever expected, and we did it so well. It was a kind of a quiet competence. That ammunition movement basically uh, moved almost 60,000 short tons of ammunition. If I were going to uh, characterize it, I'd say that our job literally got expanded by a factor of, uh, uh, of tenfold over that period of time. To accomplish that, we had to get an awful lot of help from our transportation battalion. The guys over there counted on those missiles being there. And it was an overall around the clock job, 24 hours. There was no rest. We had two shifts, so there was a lot of hours and manpower that was put into this mission. In wartime is a very serious situation. You need to have it there on time. That way, everyone completes the full circle of support. President Bush briefly addressed the nation to announce that he had ordered the military to use all forces available. Allied forces struck Iraq troops in a massive land offensive after Saddam Hussein. The ground attack marks the start of the biggest U.S. land engagement since Vietnam. shot and move. We really never knew what we hit or how bad we destroyed things until we actually drove up through it maybe a couple hours later or the next day. We were moving north and the reason I knew and guys in, in our section and battalion knew that we were actually going into the war was we crossed the berm between Iraq and Saudi Arabia and we knew once we hit that point there was no turning back and we crossed it early in the morning on the morning of the 24th. The things that the aircraft did is amazing. And we can tell you that we went out on missions where with no lights on, went out shooting targets at five plus kilometers and he destroyed them at nighttime. And a lot of, you'll hear recollections of people taking prisoners of war. When Apaches are going out destroying bunkers and guys are coming out dazed and confused because they couldn't hear us, they couldn't see us, and we had uh, Apaches taking prisoners of war. There's something quite awesome about a piece of machinery that, that you can engage somebody 
at 2,800 meters at night in the fog when it's raining, and they don't even see a muzzle flash, and the tanks to the left and right of them explode. We, there, was a, there was a major that was captured who was commenting on that, that they, they didn't even see us. And tanks around him were blowing up. And, you know, we're, we're engaging targets at 28, 2,500 meters, and they can't, they can't even see 800 meters. Regardless of what meter you're in, it's, it's a little technique or procedure that you use. But the old principles of uh, scouts out, security, mass, speed versus haste, uh, all those fundamentals remain valid. You know, that's why you didn't get so much return fire. Yes, sir, table 12 is right on. That's, that's really a key, key training event. And, uh, and fire distribution was the absolute key. And he who fires first wins, you know, in armored fights, and we fired first. And, uh, and, uh, and the M181 doesn't miss, sir. I mean, it just, it doesn't miss at all. And a couple of times, I saw a lot of explosions on the battlefield that were, that were quite huge. I mean, catastrophic kills on, on the enemy tanks. And they were so big, I mean, and they were in the same direct line of sight as some of our vehicles. And I thought for sure that, that I was seeing a couple of our vehicles explode. And every time I'd roll past a Hulk, I expected it to be an M1 or a Bradley. And uh, at that point, I knew going over to the next crest, I was, I thought for sure I was going to die. And I was saying a few prayers. But even at that point, I kept going, and the rest of my platoon never hesitated. I've never been more proud in almost 32 years in the Army to have served with, with any soldiers as I have with these. Their willingness to take the battle to the enemy time after time in bad weather, sandstorms, in the rain, their heroism, their confidence in each other, their toughness, and their great skill makes heroes of them all. funny feeling when you pull the trigger. It gives you a real funny feeling when you pull the trigger knowing that you've taken someone's life. But you know that uh, you haven't taken anything that, that that man hasn't offered. Our effort during Desert Shield and Desert Storm was a total army effort. After deployment of a large force to Southwest Asia, jobs were left vacant in many critical areas. These voids were filled quickly by individual reservists and units from the United States. These professionals joined the USER team in sustaining care and services for soldiers and families in Germany until the dusty warriors from the Middle East returned home. What the people did in Southwest Asia was heroic and courageous, very professional. But it could not have been done without the people back here in Usra. For instance, at one point in time, we had 19,000 soldiers on guard, which was just about everybody. Secondly, they set up all the family support groups, family action centers, the helpful one lines to take care of the families. So you had security, and you had assistance, and you had compassion and caring. And at the same time, they were training to be able to go off in case they were needed also. The leaders were there. The units were trained. And I think uh, the other critical piece is that uh, the soldiers and the families knew that we cared and would take care of the families while they were deployed. So I think that focus uh, was right on, proved to be right, and stays the main focus. Although a lot of the glory and media attention went to the fellows and the gals doing the fighting. A tremendous amount of, of uh, recognition ought to go to those uh, soldiers that stayed back here. Uh, because while um, the, our 7th Corps was fighting in Southwest Asia, a large number of our soldiers were involved in, in security back here, security of our housing areas, security of our key installations. They still continue to do their training. 
They were responsible for supporting the force in Southwest Asia. So they had a lot uh, to do here and a very large role in the success of the 7th Corps. So they all feel proud about that. I'd say we did quite a bit, you know, if not just as much as the guys over in Saudi. And some of us wish we were there, but we weren't. We were here working, and we worked very strenuous hours. And we did do quite a bit. You know, the threat was here, but we didn't have anything uh, actually come up. And I think because of the dogs being present and all the other soldiers in the, in the area. As far as security goes, uh, it was outstanding as far as I was concerned. My wife informed me they had roving patrols around here constantly, 24 hours a day. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to all the people that pulled guard here at Kelly and all over uh, Europe. Uh, it was ease of mind for me to know that my family was very well taken care of. I was at school this morning. My friend told me, he said, do you know what happened? And I said, no. And he said that the ceased fire and the war was over. And I was real happy because I knew all the people's parents would come home. Family members in U.S. Army Europe have also paid the price for combat readiness and freedom. Training exercises, order duty, Desert Shield, Desert Storm separated Usura families, but brought Usura family members closer together. I think you have to, because you don't have the family here. You don't have uh, uh, a mother that you can call. You don't have um, sisters and brothers that you, can, that you can go to. I think you have to depend on each other for that family support. And you do become a family. You know, I can't pick up the phone and talk two hours to my mom or dad, and we have to draw from each other. And we've done a wonderful job. I mean, the ladies have done fantastic. I think it was probably one way of dealing with the stress of the situation is that you would not let yourself think about, oh, what this is doing to me. So you would worry about taking care of the lady that had the five children, trying to get three of them ready in the morning by herself, or providing a stable Christmas for your family. Getting the Christmas tree was a, was a big deal for, for women to go out and buy that tree and maybe lug it up four flights of stairs and, and put it in that stand and have to saw it off and put it up. And, and that was my case. And when my son and I finished that Christmas tree, it was the most beautiful Christmas tree we'd ever seen. It's really sad, but before this, I was never really close to my mom. Yeah. And I feel, I feel really bad because it's taken something like this to bring us so close together. And it's, it's great. I think it depended on the ages of your children, okay? Each, each age group went through a different type of stress. And what came out at our, our meeting on stress, um, mothers wanted to know how to explain this to a four-year-old. And then, of course, we had that wonderful little book that, that came out. Um, someone I know went to, to Saudi. Well, perhaps. I really feel sad because he's gone, and I want him to come back. And when I heard about this <laughs> ceasefire, that's it, um, I thought now he's going to come back and now we can play games, and I won't have to do them by myself. Usura's role in Southwest Asia did not end with Operation Desert Storm. The support continued with the deployment of over 5,000 soldiers to Operation Provide Comfort and 3,700 soldiers to Kuwait. The United States Army Europe trained for over 45 years to keep the peace in Europe. More than 5.5 million soldiers contributed to the success of Usura and the end of the Cold War nation's keepers of the peace never lost focus as units were called upon to deactivate and return home. There were no victory marches at the Cold War's end. As 
units readied for a drawdown of forces in Europe, Usurer was called upon to deploy the largest fighting force to war since World War II. Soldiers who were trained to deter aggression in Europe fought and won a decisive victory in Southwest Asia. The forces remaining in Europe sustained Usurer's mission of deterrence and supported the forward deployed forces. to go where the training is excellent, or should I say outstanding, go to Europe first. Never underestimate an American soldier. Never. To support 1st Armored Division. Ooh. But you never know. The time may come up, boom, you gotta go. And if you don't train the standards, then you can't do it. It's hard to believe that there's people had to walk around with gas masks, had to give their children gas masks, uh, have sealed rooms, and we wanted to stop that from happening. Outstanding. Outstanding. I, I would take the M1A1 tank up against anything in the world. The crew chiefs and the pilots really took care of their aircraft and the Apache really came through for us. There's this, there's this little restaurant right outside of the gate in Bamberg called La Italia, and, and the food is outstanding. That's where I'm going to go first. We were important to those soldiers in, down in Southwest Asia, and they knew it, and they recognized it, and I, I don't think they could have done any more for us. We made a promise to each other that if he would take care of the, the soldiers, I was willing to take care of the soldiers' lives. The folks that were behind that had to do all of the work to get them out of here and sustain them played an integral and absolutely important role in that, uh, in that mission. We're the best. We're the best in the world, and we proved it. And no one can take that away from us. Now, on the 20th century, the Persian Gulf War. August 2nd, 1915.